check, check, check. Sorry about that. I was on the phone. Y'all come on in. Oh man. How are y'all doing? Ready? The last hurrah. Last class, yeah. Don't no crying, please. No no tears. Hello at home. Can y'all hear me, see me, see the screen? Yes, sir. <clears throat> okay, thank you, Roman. Okay, let's get down to business. Nine o'clock, last class. Um, so a reminder, we don't meet next week until thir thir uh, Wednesday, sorry, Wednesday. And we will be here at 9 a.m. to take the final. I sent out, you now have what, three different things to look at for the, for the final? And just remember, like, you know, that's, that's a guide, right? Um, I think your final will be similar in terms of the scope of material, all right? But, you know, if there's a problem that says find a McLaurin series or something, like, you should go review McLaurin series because it could be any, anything that was from the homework or lecture or from the textbook. So, all right. Well, we have uh, four sections to cover today. But they're, they're real straightforward, so I don't think we're going to have that much of an issue here. Um, the, we already started last class talking about parametric curves um, and parametric equations, and I was showing you how you can use your calculator, right? So I'm going to breeze through this first part because I already talked about it. Remember what a traditional function is, y equals f of x. This means y depends on x. And, you know, we have a picture of a parabola. And uh, this notation that what we've done traditionally is we've defined a function f, which takes a number in, so it takes a real number, and it spits out a real number, all right? That's, that's what a traditional function is. The problem that we have with this, this idea of a function is that we have issues where we have curves that we want to be able to draw, but we can't draw it using that standard function because we'll have an input that goes to two different outputs. And so, you know, we'd like to have a way around that. So the solution is to, instead of having a function F that goes from R to R, we'll have a function, here I call it capital F, that goes from R, so it takes a number in, which we usually call T, which is called the parameter. And that's where the word parametric curves or parametric equations come from. And what it does is it takes that number in, and it spits out an ordered pair, a point. So we were talking about this after class the other day. One way to look at it is that, you know, normally, normally what happens with a normal function, think of it like a pencil. 
is that you move along the x-axis and a normal function, y is a function of x. So as I move to the right, the y coordinate depends on the x and then I, I draw the curve, okay? But I'm constantly moving to the right as I draw the curve, maybe like a sine function or something like that. That's a standard function. With the parametric, what's happening is that you have your pencil and you have this thing in the background that's running like a clock and the parametric uh, functions, the f of t and g of t, they control both your left and right and your up and down. So the f of t controls this motion and then the g of t controls this motion. And so by doing that, you can draw, you can have it do anything you want it to do and you don't have to you know, do a traditional, just move to the right and go up and down. So I think of it more like a CNC machine or something where it has, you know, it, it's, it's designed to go around and draw whatever image you want. So that's the idea. So we, we looked at this last time. Um, if we let the X be F of T, which is cosine of T and Y be G of T, which is sine of T, this draws the unit circle. You, know, you need to know that moving ahead. This is a standard parametric curve, cosine t, sine t. And when you do that, it draws this. Now, I'm going to zoom out a little bit here. Um, I'm going to play this like a, like a movie here. And I'm going to have to slow it down just a little bit. So as time goes on, this is what I was saying. As time goes on, it's, it's telling me where to put my, my um, x and y position as a function of time. And so you're never going to have, uh, let me see here. So like for this point right here, right? For this point right here, the input is two pi over three. Okay, so that's what this is. We're gonna see the input value, that's this number. And then these are your two um, X and Y coordinate. This is your X and Y coordinate respectively. So you can see that when my input is two pi over three, I'm up here, right? Well, if I go around, well, first of all, down here, what you know, this used to be a problem because we would have a vertical line test fail. But here you can see that down here it doesn't matter. My input's different. I have a different input, so it, I don't have. I'm not violating that one input goes to two different plate, two different places. Also, if I continue around the circle and come back around and go back up to that point right there that I was at earlier, I still have not violated being a function because the input is now eight pi over three. So it's a different input, even though you're drawing the same curve. So it's, it's like, not only is it that we don't have to worry about the vertical line test, we don't even have to worry about the fact that the curve can draw itself and go over itself over and over and over. It's still a function, all right? So very nice. Um, let's see, we did this. I had you do this on your calculator where we did t, t squared on the calculator and it drew your parabola, right? And then I said, switch them and do t squared t, and it drew the parabola sideways, okay? So here's just this, this is just a different example, okay? This is just an example that I, I decided to put in here. The, uh, the curve here, the function we have is the x coordinate is sine of t minus sine of 2.3t, and the y coordinate is cosine t. And if you were to do that, this is what it draws. So you can start to get some very, very complicated <clears throat> curves drawn using parametric curves or parametric equations. And the good thing is, <clears throat> you know, in the real world, we, a lot of times we're trying to model something that's happening, right? And we don't want to have this restriction of, well, if something's moving, it still has to follow the vertical line test. We don't want to, you know, we don't, we don't want that, right? We want to have the freedom to have it be something more natural, like, I always think of this as like if I just like put a little roly poly on the ground and let him start walking around, you know, it's like he's going to do what he wants to do, you know, so I would like to be able to do calculus on something like this, right. So that's what this, uh, this next section is going to be is what, what can we do in terms of calculus with these types of curves. Um, here's another great example. This is a famous example. This is a cycloid. This is the parametric equation for it. The X coordinate is here and the Y coordinate is here. And what it is, is it, the, 
The curve is the blue curve, okay? That's the curve that gets drawn as, as you let t start at zero and go out. Here I'm going from zero to four pi. And it draws this little hump and then another hump. Those, those two curves, those little pieces right there represent the path of, I like to think of it as like, if you've got a rock stuck in your tire, okay? Imagine you had like a rock stuck in your tire. What would be the path of that rock? What would it look like as you're driving? What would the rock be doing? And so this blue path describes the path of the rock. So it's stuck, boom, it comes back to the ground. So that's the path of the rock. Understand? That's called a cycloid. So it would be nice if we could say, hey, right there, like how fast was it going? What direction is it going, right? So it would be nice if we could find maybe like a tangent line here, right? All right. So in general, all parametric um, equations or, or parametric curves are, are some function of t for x and some other function of t, g of t for y, where t is between two um, values, usually alpha and beta. Um, we use alpha and beta because most of the time, well, I'm not going to say it. A lot of parametric curves involve the trig functions. So Alpha and beta seem kind of natural because the, we use those variables for um, angles. All right, so I already showed you how you can switch uh, your mode on your calculator to parametric to draw things. So that's something I think you should just go play with on your own. Just go try and graph different things, adjust your window and all that and, and have fun. All right, that's it for 9.1, all right? Parametric curves. Now 9.2 is the calculus the calculus of parametric curves. So now the first question would be, what is the slope of the tangent line, right? Like if we have a curve, can we find the slope of the tangent line? Remember from Cal one, right? That dy dx is what the slope of the tangent line is, right? dy dx. Now, if we take dy dx and we do something tricky but clever, we can rewrite d, uh, sorry, we can rewrite um, d, well, hold on, let me back up. If we think about what dy dt is, all right, just, just algebraically, dy dt is the change in y with respect to t. We can always write dy dt as dy dx times dx dt, meaning that, we're just being clever that these two could cancel and we get, D, this is the same, right? Like dy dt is the same as dy dx times dx dt. It just is algebraically this thing, right? Now, if we, if we agree to that, then what we can do is we can solve for dy dx and by just dividing both sides by dx dt. So you get this formula right here. So if you want to know the change in y with respect to x, then all you need to know is the change in y with respect to t divided by the change in x with respect to t. Now, how is that going to work for us? Okay, how is that going to work for us? Let's do this one right here. So that's the, that's the formula for the slope of the tangent line. That's it right there. Let's go ahead and do it, do this example. So it says <clears throat> slope of the tangent line to the unit circle. So let's say we have the unit circle here, right? Um, we have to all agree that this is, um, F of T is cosine T, Y of T is um, sine T draws us the unit circle and T is between zero and two pi. By the way, um, from last class, this is the unit circle. How would I do a circle of radius, uh, let's say 10? What would I change here to make this a circle of radius 10 instead of a radius of one? 10 in front of both of them, right? You just slap a 10 right here, you slap a 10 right there. Now you'd have a circle of radius 10. So you have complete freedom to, to do that. Um, I'm not going to, so. All right, so here we go. I want to know, can we find the slope of the tangent line at the point uh, root two over two, root two over two? Let me just draw this geometrically, just to give us uh, an idea of what we're doing here. We know that this is the unit circle, right? 
So it has a radius of one. We know that this point here lives on our unit circle, root two over two, root two over two. And what we're trying to find is the slope of the tangent line there, right? We want the slope of that, which is dy dx from Cal one. But we just came up with the formula that dy dx is what? dy dt over dx dt. Now, look at, look at this top part. We want dy dt. We want to know the derivative of y with respect to t, right? Well, look at our equation. We know that y is equal to sine of t, right? y is sine of t. So if I write that down over here on the side, if y is sine of t, then if I differentiate both sides with respect to t, I just get cosine t, all right? That's all I get. So I know that the numerator here is just cosine t. And then I divide this by, well, now I need to know what dx dt is, but x is cosine t, right? So if I jot that down over here on the side, x is equal to uh, cosine t, then the dx with respect to t, the derivative with respect to t would be negative sine t. And so I know that the denominator is negative sine t. And that's it, okay? That is our derivative. That is the general derivative for this circle. Now what you need to do is tell me what the derivative is, what the slope of tangent line is at this point, root two over two, root two over two. So what are you gonna have to do to figure this out? In order to find the derivative, right? What do we, what do we need to know in order to find the derivative here? We need to know what t is, right? Now, t is the clock running in the background, isn't it? And so what I need to figure out is what t takes me to this point, all right? I need to know what t gives me that value. So I need to find the t such that the original The original function, cosine t, sine t, that's the original function, right? Or the original parametric curve. That's this. I wanna know what t is going to spit out root two over two, root two over two. And I have to be between zero and two pi, right? I have to be between zero and two pi. So what do you think? So cosine, cosine of what angle, right? Cosine of what angle gives you root two over two? So where is the X coordinate root two over two? What angle is this? Pi over four, pi over four, right? Yes? And then also sine of pi over four would be root two over two. You're basically solving two equations right now. You're trying to figure out where is cosine of t equal to pi over two. And the other thing you're trying to find is when is sine of t equal to root two over two. And remembering that t has to be restricted between zero and two pi, because there are an infinite number of answers. All right, so where does this happen simultaneously, right? Aren't there two answers for this first one? Think about this. Aren't there two answers where it's root two over two? And there are two answers for this one, right? But we're looking for the one that gives us both simultaneously. Where are the two places that this happens? In the unit circle? Isn't it here and here? Yeah. And then over here on this one, that happens, sine is the y coordinate, right? It happens here and here. We're looking for the one that coincides. It gives us both at the same time, which would have to be this one which is why the t must be pi over four. Okay, yeah, good, good. So we have, 
we have one solution when t is pi over four is when we are at that point. Got it? So what we need to do now, well, now that we know what it is, t must be pi over four. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this derivative answer and we're gonna plug in pi over four. So at t equals pi over four, we get dy dt, or dy dx, sorry, equals, what was it? Cosine of pi over four over sine, negative sine of pi over four, which equals, well, cosine of pi over four, we already know that that's root two over two. And sine of pi over four is also root two over two, but it's negative sine down there, right? So it's negative root two over two. And that just turns out to be negative one. Your slope is negative one. Which makes sense if you look at the picture, right? If you look back at this slope, right? It looks like the slope of that tangent line should be negative one. With me? So let me add to this a part B. Same thing, find slope of tangent line at zero one. So let's see, where are we? We, we draw a little quick circle here. Zero one is up here. I want to know the slope of the tangent line. Now we know the answer, right? What's the answer going to be? Zero, right? But let's let's show it. What t value gets you there? Pi over two, right? So we should know from that that this is happening at pi over two. So at t equals pi over two, we get dy dx equals. I'm using the derivative formula again, which was cosine a pi over two over negative sine of pi over two. And cosine of pi over two is zero over sine of pi over two is one, but there's a negative down there. So you get zero over negative one, which is zero. And that matches with what we thought we would get. Questions? Now, out of curiosity, what about here? What if I asked you to find it at this point, slope and tangent line here? Isn't that the point uh, one zero? All right, should be undefined. Let's see, does it work? What t value gives you this point? Zero, or you could do two pi, all right? Either one, but let's go with zero, all right? So here t would be zero, and then the derivative with respect to x here would be cosine of zero, over negative sine of zero, and that gives you on top of one, and on the bottom you get zero, and that's undefined, which matches with what's going on, okay? <clears throat> so this is the way it works for all parametric curves. If you wanna find the slope of the tangent line, all you've gotta do is crank out this quick formula, all right? Pretty good? And we could just keep doing examples now, but I mean, that's it. That's, there's nothing else to it. That's the formula. Do y'all want to do another one? It's up to you. Oh, okay. So when we were applying this formula, right? The derivative of Y with respect to X, what we'll do is we'll take the derivative of Y with respect to T first. So we took the derivative of this, this function right here with respect to T, which is cosine T. And then we divide by derivative of x with respect to t. Here's x, right? So derivative of that with respect to t is negative sine. Because we're taking derivative of cosine. Let's just do another one. Let's just do another one. All right, let's, let's say that we have the parametric curve that's given by x is equal to, um, uh, let's just go with, let's go with t cubed. And let's say that y is equal to t squared plus one, all right? And I want you to find dy dt, uh, dy dx, sorry. Now, let me just say it the other way. Find slope of tangent line at 
eight five at the point eight five. All right. So let's first crank the formula out. The formula is dy dx is equal to dy dt over dx dt, right? Now, what is the derivative of y with respect to t? So look at the numerator here only. What is that? 2t. And what is the derivative of x with respect to t? 3t squared. So if I reduce that out, I get two over three T, right? All right, that's the slope of the tangent line at some given value of T. So I want the slope of the tangent line at eight five. So I've got to figure out how my, how my curve, what does it take for my curve to land at that point? So I want to know when does this T cubed become an eight? And when does T squared plus one become a five? So I would have to solve these. When does t cubed become eight? And then when does t squared plus one become five? I have to find a t that satisfies both of those simultaneously. So what's the solution to the first equation? Two, okay, now does that work for the second one? It needs to work for both. So yeah, we got, well, not lucky I made the problem up, so it, it worked, okay? So t has to be two, right? So all I do now is take this derivative and say at t equals two, dy dx will be, let's see, one third, two over three times two. So you get one third. Yeah, that's annoying up there. Let me get rid of that. Make sense? Okay, let me go to Desmos. Desmos allows you to graph parametric curves, but I forget how. I think you just type it in as an as like a pair. So you do something like this. Uh, what was it? T cubed and then T squared plus one. Well, that's it. Now, I don't know why it, it automatically by default made T go between zero and and uh, one, I'm gonna go negative five to five. There's, there's the graph, okay? And we went to the point, what, two eight? Or eight, eight five. So I plot that point, there it is. And we found the slope of a tangent line of one third, right? Could I ask you for the equation of the tangent line? I could, right? What would the equation, if I change that from slope to the equation, you would go to this good old formula, y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1 from Cal1. And then you'd say y minus, okay, y1 is the y coordinate, which is five, equals the slope, which we found to be one third, and then x minus eight. Right? That would be the equation of the tangent line. It's just one additional step once you find the slope. The reason I did that is because I want to graph it and I want to show you that we actually found the right thing. So you ready? So I'm going to just do y minus five equals one third x minus eight. There we go. So we found the equation of the tangent line to that curve at that point, all right? We have something weird happening at zero, don't we? Look at, I'm sorry, not at zero, at this point zero one, right? That's the point zero one. At the point zero one, what's T, right? This is the point zero one. So at, if I were to have changed this problem to be not here, but at the point zero one, you would have to figure out what T makes that true, right? Which would be what? What T do I plug in to get zero and then one? Zero, right? T is zero, but wait, if you try and plug zero into the derivative, what happens? It's undefined. You have a cusp there, remember? Derivatives don't exist at cusps. So everything is pretty much lining up with what we did in Cal 1. I realize Cal 1's been a while, but. All right, that's it, okay? With that, well, that's it for that. 
Okay. Now, let's talk about areas. Now, area is a little bit weird. It's a little tricky. So recall that the area under a curve, right? Back in the good old days, beginning of this class, if you have a function y equals f of x on some interval a, b, it was the integral, right? All we did is we took the integral of the function. Here, y is, y is the function, right? So x here was the independent variable and a, b were, were the limits on x, right? So when x is some function of t, and y is some other function of t, right? So if we go to parametric instead, then the restrictions here are that t has to be in some interval, right? How does it change this up here? Well, it doesn't change it by much because y, right? Y is still, what's y? Y is just some function of t, isn't it? Which we'll know, it'll be given to us. All we really need to figure out is what's dx? So what we do is we take dx dt, remember the derivative of x with respect to t, that's just the derivative of that, uh, that x function, isn't it? And then we multiply both sides by dt. If I multiply both sides by dt, I get um, dx dt equals f prime of t dt. See what I did there? Just algebraically multiply both sides of this equation by dt. And, and yes, so this becomes a direct replacement. This right here is g of t, and this right here is f prime of d, f prime of t dt. And then your limits of integration change from alpha to beta, and that is it. Okay, let me show you. Let me show you this first, and then we'll and then we'll uh, you can uh, hopefully understand a little better. I'm actually not going to do the example I have here. I'm going to do an easier example first. Let's do this one. What if X is equal to, what if X is equal to T and Y is equal to T squared? And I wanna do it on the interval zero one and I want you to find the area. So the area is gonna be basically the area between the curve and the X axis. Okay, this is from the curve to the X axis. Now, do y'all know what that curve is? If I draw that, what is it? T, T squared, it's a parabola, right? So we're really, at the end of the day, what we're really doing is we're taking this, we're only looking at it between zero and one, right, there's that curve, and we're trying to find the area between that and the x-axis down here. That's what we're trying to find, right? So, According to the formula, what I'm going to do is this. I'm going to do the integral from alpha to beta. And then I'm going to do g of t. Then multiply that times f prime of t dt. Here, when we say, you know, what's g and what's f, this is the f function. And this is the g function. So what would you get? Integral from... Well, our restriction on t is zero to one, right? So we're gonna go zero to one. What's g of t? t squared. And what's f prime of t? One. So that's just dt. That's the integral from zero to one of t squared dt, right? Which we could do, that's just one third t cubed evaluated from zero to one. So if you plug in one, you get one third and you plug in zero, you get zero. So the answer is one third, right? That's exactly the answer you would have gotten had I given you this. Why is, um, uh, sorry, why is X squared? Look at it on zero one and find the area. What would you have done? Integral zero to one you're integrating x squared dx. Isn't this the exact same integral? This is the exact same integral, isn't it? Because the variable doesn't matter, right? T or x. Do you all see that? Remember last class I told you that you can use the parametric mode on your calculator to replace 
the regular mode, all you have to do is just always let the X be T, right? And then let the Y be the function it was gonna be before, yeah? Do y'all see why this formula will always be, will always generate the same as the original integral? Why is it? The F prime will always be one, right? And then the, this function will always be the function that you were talking about to begin with. So that's great for this. Now we need to look at an example where it's not like this, right? So check this out. This always blows my freaking mind. Really, you know, I talk to people about why I, I, you know, been doing this for 20 years. Like, why do I continue? You would think after a while you get tired, tired of talking about the same thing for 20 years. But it really is not about me. It's about you. And it's about showing you things. I still get excited when I can show you something that, that's just like, whoa, okay. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I like to see people go like, oh, wow. Okay. So if you go back and you look in our notes, there was a point in time where we, we proved what the area of a circle was. And it took a little bit of work. Okay. We'd have to go back in our notes and look at it. I believe we needed trigonometric substitution to do it. So what we're gonna do now is we're gonna find the area of a circle of radius r. We're gonna prove the formula that the area of a circle is pi r squared, but we're gonna do it with parametric, okay? We're going to see what happens. So first agree with me that if I let x be f of t be capital R cosine t and y be g of t equal capital R sine t, that this is gonna draw me a circle of radius capital R. So capital R here is a fixed number, yes? So this should draw me a circle and the radius of this thing should be capital R. Um, by the way, I'm only going from zero to pi. All right, zero to pi. That's only gonna draw me what part of it? The top half, right? And so that the area I'm gonna find is gonna be this area. So whatever I get for an answer here, I'm gonna wanna double it, right? With me? Okay, here we go. So the formula is integral alpha to beta um, g of t f prime of t dt. All right, for us, this is integral zero to pi. g of t is capital R sine t, right? That's g of t. And then what is capital R um, uh, cosine t? Take its derivative. Negative r capital R, right? Negative R sine T dt, isn't it? All right, capital R is a, is a constant. Let's pull the constant out. That's an R squared, right? And it's a negative. So I'm gonna pull out a negative R squared. Integral zero to pi of sine squared T dt. Remember how to do that? Sine squared. Yes, power reducing formula, exactly. So this will become negative capital R squared integral zero to pi. Okay, so we're doing the power reducing formula. So you have a one half and then you have one minus cosine of two T dt, that, that's just the formula. That's the power reducing formula for sine squared. Sine squared t becomes one half times one minus cosine two t. Look familiar? Okay, I'm gonna pull the uh, one half out, negative r squared over two, integral zero to pi. Uh, let's see, I'm gonna do the antiderivative of one minus cosine two t dt, which is, negative r squared over two. Here comes the antiderivative. Antiderivative of one. Uh, yeah, t, t, t. So yeah, just the variable t. And then this one, we have to scale, right? We're doing an antiderivative minus one half sine two t, right? Zero to pi. 
if you go back and look in your notes, when we did this earlier, we had to then use sine 2t. We had to do like a half angle identity because we had to do a reference triangle and all this shit. No more. We don't need it anymore. Okay. We're here with t, so we're happy. So let's plug in um, t for, uh, zero, sorry, pi for t. Okay. So if I plug in pi, I get r squared over two. And then I get, let's see, pi. Whoa. Pi. Minus, what's sine of two pi? Because I'm plugging in pi right here, sine of two pi. Zero, that's all gone, okay, got that. Now minus, now we plug in zero, and if we plug in zero, what do we get? Zero here, sine of zero, zero, yeah, zero, okay. So what are we getting here? We're getting a negative, this is weird. Yes? Go with me on this? Okay, this is the answer. This is the answer for the area. Now, this was half, right? This was half of it, half the circle. So if this was half the circle, you double it. So if I take this and multiply it by two, then I get the negative r squared pi, right? What was the, now, I, look, we'll talk about the negative in a second, but what's the formula for the area of a circle? Pi r squared, okay? So we have the, we have the answer, it's just, it, the, the weird thing is that it's negative, right? Um, we never squared the, we never, the negative came from, where the negative come from? Right here, the derivative of this, right? Was where we got the negative from. And when we put these two together, we weren't doing a negative times a negative. So it stayed negative r squared. No, because the negative is on the outside. So if negative r squared, if I plug in r is two, let's say you get negative four, you would have to have negative r squared, then it would, right? But the question becomes, why are we getting a negative, right? Like this is, this something is, something is different, right? Well, it has to do with the fact that you, do you remember when we were doing normal integration? When we were doing normal integration, we were doing like rectangles, right? And what we were doing was moving from left to right, right? We were moving from left to right. And so our dx was always positive, right? This is not the same sort of picture because t is running in the background. So dt doesn't always have to be positive because it's not always going left and right, up and down. So when you put that together, you don't necessarily have to get, you're gonna get the right answer, but it could be off by a sign. So if it's an area problem, you just take the absolute value of it. This is a common thing with parametrics is that because of the way things get drawn, you might have negative areas in, within the, the uh, answer. Now, I believe, let me see, if we go from, hold on, if we go from pi to two pi. No, we'll still get that, that's negative will still be there. I'm just thinking there's different ways to draw this. You can traverse, you can traverse it a different way. Um, look, let me show you something. You could have gone first quadrant and then go by four. Yep. Yeah, that would have worked also. Mm -hmm. uh, I think we're still going to get, yeah, because it came from that derivative being negative, right? That's what it came from. So look, I'm going to do something here. I'm going to get rid of this and get rid of this, get rid of this. So look, if I just do um, cosine t comma sine t, right? And then down here, I'm going to do cosine m comma sine m. Ooh, sine m. And add a slider and go here to 2 pi. OK, so watch. Zero to 2 pi. Okay, 
So here we've got the unit circle, right? The way that this gets drawn is as follows. It goes like this. As I draw it, look at it, right? Getting drawn. So think about what the rectangles would look like as you draw them. Think about what they'd look like. As you start to move, as you start to change T, you start drawing this, your rectangles are going to be starting to get drawn from this side, right? And start moving across. So what's your X changing? Your X is changing negative, isn't it? So all the little DXs become negative because you're moving from left to right. Does that make sense? Even though time is moving, T is moving from zero to two pi, your X is, your, your little DXs are negative, which is why it's giving you a negative area. Make sense? So going from only from zero to pi over two, you would still get negative area. Now watch, this is why I wanted to show you this. That's one way to draw a unit circle. That's the standard way to draw it, but watch this. What if I do this? Um, instead of cosine T, sine T, I'm gonna do sine T, cosine T. Okay, and I'm gonna do that from zero to two pi. Okay, it's the same circle, all right? It's the same circle. But what changes here is that the way it gets drawn. So now if I do sine M, cosine M, look at where it starts the drawing, right? You see where it starts the drawing and then watch as time goes. Ah, it's drawing it clockwise. You see that? So if I did that instead, let me get rid of the other one. If I did that one instead, right? If I did this and only did it from T equals zero to what? That's, this is T equals zero. Or, yeah, this would be T equals zero. And then I go to pi over two, that should give me a positive area. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah, because as the, if, you, if you imagine the rectangles again, they're gonna be going that way. And then how would it go when you set up the, the formula, you take the derivative of the sine and, or the sine, uh, wait, hold on. Yeah, the sine instead of the cosine, and that's just gonna be positive cosine, so it'll work. All right, make, make kind of sense? Either way, it's right. Just remember that you don't wanna put a negative for your area. Yes. Now, one thing you do have to pay attention to here is that you, you, what would have happened if you would have gone from zero to two pi? Yeah, but what would have happened? What would your area, your areas would have canceled? The way, the way to think about that is, we went from zero to pi, right? And so what happened is, we drew the circle like that to here, like that. And so when we moved from, from right to left, we got all the little DXs to be negative. So we got a negative area, right? Now, when you draw the second half of it down here, right? Now your little rectangles are gonna be down here, but it, you're moving now from left to right. So that area is gonna be positive. And so the answer at the end should be zero. And you should see it if you do, if we change it from zero to two pi, what was it again? It was a uh, cosine T, it was negative R squared came out. And then it was, it would have been, or what was it? No, it was sine sine, right? So sine squared T, DT, that's what it was. And then we did the antiderivative, we got negative R squared over two, and then it was T minus one half, one half, uh, sine t, right? Sine 2t. If you do this from uh, 2 pi, 0, 2 pi, then what happens? Well, wait a minute. Hold on. Are we going to get 0? We're not getting 0. Oh, yeah. Okay, this is going to work. This is this tricky. This is tricky. So, yeah, look what happens when we plug in two pi here, we get two pi, right? Plug in two pi here, we get zero. And then we plug in zero, we get zero and zero. So we get the whole, we, we do get the right answer. We get pi r squared, but it's negative, right? Now, why is it? Kristen, I think, gets it. 
Yeah. So here, as if we, I was trying, to, if we were trying to find the the area of one of these, right? Just one of them. The width is negative, right? Because we're moving from right to left, but then the height is what positive. So your your area there will be negative. Now when we get to one of these. Now we're moving left to right. The width is what positive, but the height because you're below the x-axis is negative. And so when you multiply those, you get negative area also. So when you put the two together, you'll get the whole area. It can be a little tricky. So it's important to, to know what the picture looks like. All right, if it, if that helps. All right, let's keep going. We did, however, prove that the area of a circle is pi r squared which is nice again. All right, the next thing is we'd like to know the arc length. How long is a curve that's parametric, right? And if you go back and you look at our formula from earlier this semester, to find the length of a curve y equals f of x on some interval a, b, then it was the, the integral from a to b, of the square root of one plus the derivative of y squared. Remember that formula, dx? Yeah, okay, so here the derivative of y was dy dx, all right? Now there's some algebra we can do here. Didn't we have a formula earlier today, just a little while ago for dy dx? It was dy dt over dx dt. If I plug that in there and start getting common denominators and square stuff, Believe me, trust me, you get this formula, okay? I'm not going to work through it. So this becomes this, and, and really this is a super easy formula to, to do, because all it is is the integral from alpha to beta. It's the derivative of the x function squared plus the derivative of the y function squared, square root. And then that's it. If you can integrate that, you're in business. So look at this, find the circumference of a circle. We did this in class earlier this semester. All right, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna take, I'm gonna copy all of this. All right, so according to, according to this, if I want to find the circumference of the circle, all I need to do is take the integral from zero to two pi of the square root. Okay, and then all I do is I take the derivative of the x function first with respect to t. What's the derivative of this with respect to t? Negative r sine t, right? But then I'm supposed to square it, right? So I square negative, negative r sine t, that should become r squared sine squared t, right? r squared sine squared t plus, and now I take the derivative of the y function, which is this one, which would be, what's the derivative of that? r cosine t, and then square it. r squared cosine squared t, dt. They both have r squared, right? I can factor an r squared out. What's left when I factor r squared out? Sine squared t plus cosine squared t, which is one. So this is the square root of r squared, which is r dt. And r is a constant. So the antiderivative is rt. Evaluate it from zero to two pi. Plug in two pi for t, two pi r. Plug in zero, zero. Is that circumference of a circle? Yes. Is that easy? Way easier, right? Way easier. Now, look, I'm not saying here that everything we did before is gonna be easier. We have, 
the way it works in the real world is that you, we have these different ways of approaching things because certain problems are easier if we approach them, sorry. Certain problems are easier if we approach them from a different perspective, all right? So this is a good, parametric equations are useful for certain things and other things that would make it more complicated. So, all right, fun, fun. That is it, okay? That is it. So now what we have is this. You know the idea of a parametric equation. You can find the slope of a tangent line on a, on a parametric curve. You can find an area and you can find an arc length. There's one thing on this arc length here that I didn't mention, that I didn't mention verbally, but it's here in the notes. The condition here is that the curve, you're trying to find an arc length. The condition here is that the curve is traversed only once. So like if you try, you know how, you know how we can draw a circle, right? If you change this like from zero to four pi, then this isn't necessarily gonna give you the correct arc length because you've traversed, you've drawn two circles on top of one another. So you should only traverse the curve once if you want this formula to work, all right? All right, that is parametric and we're done. We're gonna move on to polar. <clears throat> Would you all agree that this is easier than the stuff we've done? Yeah. yeah, I wish it was like this all semester. Okay, so here's the idea. Another, this is just another way to visualize points in a plane. Look, everything you've done, everything we've done in this class, algebra, pre-cal, We've all we've always used what's called the Cartesian Cartesian coordinate system, which means that if we have a flat sheet of paper and we want to get to a point on that paper, right? If we want to get to some point, any point on that flat sheet, I need to provide you with an X and a Y coordinate. The X coordinate will tell you how far to move along the X axis. The Y coordinate will then tell you how far to travel perpendicular to the X axis up and down, and that will land you at that point, right? So in order for me to tell you a position on a flat sheet of paper in Cartesian, I have to give you two things, right? X and Y. There's another, th another way I could have done that though, okay? I could have said, all right, start here at the origin, and instead of walking out X and going up this much, imagine, I like to imagine a person standing here, like we're looking from the top down. So here I am, I'm looking down the X axis, right? The Y axis is over here. Cartesian says, walk out X, turn, and then walk this way Y, or maybe that way Y, this depends, right? That's one way to do it. Polar coordinate says this, forget this whole X and Y thing. Just tell me how far to rotate and then tell me how far to walk out. And I can still get to that point, right? You still have to give me two things though. You have to tell me how much to rotate by and you have to tell me how far to walk out. Those two quantities are theta, which would give you the rotation, and then r, which is basically the radius, right? But there's a relationship between all of this. It's a right triangle, right? So we have this relationship that the x will always be r cosine theta, and the y will, be, will always be r sine theta. Where do those come from, those relationships? Pythagorean, you can actually get this from just trig function stuff. Just right now, if I were to ask you, everyone right now, just look at that right triangle, what's cosine of theta? Think of Sokotoa. Think of uh, opposite over, the, that's adjacent over opposite. So a cosine is adjacent over opposite, so it would be what over what? In terms of this picture, it'd be, It'd be x over oh, yeah, it's, uh, hypotenuse. You said Jason. It's all right. R, right? What's sine of theta? Y over R. Okay. Look at this first equation. Multiply both sides by R. And that's what x is, right? Multiply both sides by R here. And that's what y is, right? So that's the relationship. That's where the relationship comes from. Okay, so polar is just a different way 
of navigating a flat sheet of paper. It still requires two things, but they, it's the, the, the directions on how to use them are different. Ah, oh, come on, okay. So conversion, given a point in Cartesian, right? So if someone gives you a Cartesian point, we can always convert it to, to its polar coordinates. So when we write a point in polar coordinates, we write it just like we write an ordered pair. We put a number and then another number, okay? But the first number will be the radius, how far to walk out. And the second number will be the angle to rotate, All right? So here's the conversion. To figure out what R is, you do this. Square root of X squared plus Y squared. That comes from this right triangle. If I asked you to find R, you could use Pythagorean, right? X squared plus Y squared is R squared, and then take the square root on both sides. So there's a formula to get R, and there's also a formula to get theta. If you know the opposite, right? We know, if, if someone gives us a Cartesian, we'll know the opposite and we'll know the adjacent. We'll know X and Y. So to get theta, we use the inverse tangent function. Does that make sense to you all? That if you're given X and Y, we should be able to get R and, and theta from X and Y. Now, on the other hand, if somebody gives us a polar coordinate, they give us a, a polar point, we can get to Cartesian using this. This is a very simple formula for the X is, is R cosine theta and the Y is R sine theta, and we're done. Okay. <clears throat> what the heck is that? All right, so let's <clears throat> let's do an example here. All right, so let's convert the Cartesian point to polar. So I'm telling you that that first point is Cartesian, and I want it to be in polar. So this is X and this is Y. So first thing I do is find R. R is the square root of X squared plus Y squared, which for us will be um, square root of X squared, which is 25 plus four squared, which is 16. This is square root of, what's that, 30, 40, what, 41? Whatever that is, I don't care. It's a decimal, I'll leave it. Man, this thing is itchy. When I don't shave, this thing just starts tearing up on the inside and oh my God. Ugh. Okay, that's R, what's theta? Inverse tangent of Y over X. Okay, we, we have a critical point here. You've got to tell me right now what that is. You need your calculator, all right? So do, do the inverse tangent of four over negative five and tell me what you get. And go ahead and go in degree mode. We can always go from degrees to radians. Just give it to me in degrees. Approximately what? My calculator's dead. The batteries are dead. Oh, man, I can't do it. Oh, shit. Don't get it? What'd you get? Negative, it's okay. Go ahead. Negative 38 degrees? Negative 38.65? Let's just say seven. All right, negative 30, 38.7 degrees. We have to check to make sure that that's correct because the inverse tangent has domain restrictions. So let's just think about where this point is real quick. If we were to draw it, I'm gonna draw it down here. Where would that point be? That's Cartesian, right? So I go to the left, one, two, three, four, five, right? And I go up four. Here's where I am, right? I'm right here. That's not negative 38 degrees. So my calculator thinks, here's what the calculator thinks. This is the point, uh, this is the point negative five, four. Where does my calculator think I am? The opposite of that. It thinks I'm down here. It thinks I'm at um, five, negative four. 
Because see, the calculator has no way of knowing whether or not the negative was on top or bottom. So it's always going to give you an answer. And remember, the arc tangent function, the inverse tangent is restricted. Yeah, exactly. It's restricted between negative pi over two and pi over two. So it's never going to give you an answer over there. So that means we need to translate this. Yeah, use the reference angle. They're we're saying that this is negative 38.7 degrees. So that angle right there, like if you look at this angle from like here, like as an absolute value, that's like, like 38.7 degrees. That's this angle on this side. So if this is like 38.7, then we need this angle from here to here, which would be, you have to subtract that from 180, don't you? So do 180 minus 38.7, and what do you get? 141.3 degrees. So that is the correct answer. Do you see how you have to be careful with this? This happens in physics too, when you do vectors. You always gotta be paying attention to which way you're pointed because the inverse tangent is restrictive, very restrictive. So if you wanted to get to that point, negative five, uh, negative five, four, what it's telling you, you know, if you're looking down the x-axis, y-axis, instead of going like back five and over four, it's telling you to rotate by 138 degrees and then walk out how far? Rotate by 138, or what, sorry, rotate by 141.3 degrees and walk out how far? square root of 41, and you'll land exactly at negative five, four. So the polar, the polar point is the point root 41, and then 141.3 degrees. That is the answer. You can write it in degrees, or you can convert it to radians. But if you write it in degrees, you need the degree symbol. If you don't have the degree symbol, it's understood that it's radians. Now, <clears throat> for converting from polar to Cartesian, it's much easier because you don't have any inverse functions. <clears throat> here's R, here's theta. It's, it's simple business now. X is equal to R, what is X? R cosine theta, right? R cosine theta. And so that's going to be three cosine of seven pi over six. And that'll be X. And then the Y coordinate will be R, which is three, and then sine of seven pi over six. And you can use your uh, calculator, but if you know the trig stuff here, seven pi over six is right here. And sine is the y coordinate. I mean, cosine is the x coordinate, sine is the y coordinate. So this should be three times negative root three over two. And then this one should be three. Now, sine is the y coordinate here, which is negative one half. Go with me or no? Okay. And so you get something like this, negative three root three over two is the X coordinate. And then uh, negative three halves is the Y coordinate. <clears throat> That's your Cartesian. Okay. So that's how you convert from one system to the other. Now, what do functions look like in polar coordinates? This is where things get really kind of cool. The graph of a polar curve consists of all the polar points, all the polar points that satisfy some equation. So you know how when we do Cartesian, we can say y is some function of x, solve for y, or we can say x is some function of y, and so, you know, solve for x. We normally do y is a function of x, though. Right, y, you know, y is sine of x or y is x squared or something like that. With polar, we have choice. We can solve for r or we can solve for theta, same thing. With the standard is to have r be a function of theta. So this is like it used to be y is a function of x, r is a function of theta. So the radius, the radius is a 
function of the angle. You give me an angle, I'll tell you how far to walk out. That's the whole idea. You give me an angle, I'll tell you how far to walk out. So look at this first polar e equation, R equals three. What does it look like? This is a constant function, right? It's a constant function. So give me an angle, give me an angle. I'm standing here, I'm waiting for your directions. Give me an angle. Any angle to turn. Why don't we start with no angle, okay? Just zero, okay, let's start there. And how far do I walk out? Three. I draw a point. Okay, now let me go back. Give me another angle. Five or two. Tell me how far to walk out. Draw a point. Okay, give me any other angle. Walk out. So what am I going to draw? Circle radius three. That is the equation of a circle of radius three in polar coordinates. That is like a simple ass equation, isn't it? You're in polar coordinates though. Think about what it takes to draw an equ what is What is the formula to draw a circle in Cartesian of a radius three? It would be this, wouldn't it? It would be x squared plus y squared equals nine. That is the equation that is required to draw a circle of radius three in Cartesian coordinates. This is the equation of a circle of radius three in polar coordinates. So simple, right? Does it make sense? Okay, let's look at another one. So there it is, I didn't wanna give it away. I don't know why it's drawn that many times. Okay, what about this one? So that previous example, R was a constant, right? Think of it this way, in Cartesian, when Y is a constant, what do we draw? In Cartesian, when Y is a constant, what do we draw? Y is, if Y was three, what would we draw? Horizontal line. What if X was three? We draw a vertical line, right? In polar, when R is three, we draw a circle. What if the theta is a constant? What am I gonna draw? A line. Now, what I'm gonna do is it's telling me to turn, right? To theta of pi over four. And then it's saying, do anything you want. Let your, is radius in here? Right? So I can let the radius be whatever. So I can walk out however far I want and start dropping points. I just have to stay at this angle the whole time, okay? And I can also go backwards. So when I draw this, I get y equals x, which is basically the identity function, right? It's just another way to move around. It's, it's got its advantages. It's got its disadvantages, but okay. With me, kind of? Those are the two constants. Let's look at something more interesting. R is two cosine theta. R is two cosine theta. Now you've actually got a function. You ready? I'm gonna start, I'm gonna try and draw this. All right. What I recommend is this. Let's try this with a, like a good old fashioned T table. Let's plug in theta and let's see what R's we get. And let's start with the most simple theta. Let's go with zero. So here I am, I'm aiming at zero down the X axis. And I want you to give me, when I plug zero, when, so I'm aiming this way at zero is theta. How far out do I walk? So two cosine of zero, right? Cosine of zero is what? One, so I walk out two. So I'm gonna walk out two, one, two, drop a dot right there. Okay, so I'm gonna to go to the right two, one, two, drop a dot. Uh, what's the next common angle? Um, you, I mean, we could do pi over six, we could do pi over four. How much do you wanna do? You wanna do pi over four? Let's see if pi over four is enough. Okay, so now that means I'm gonna rotate by how much? Pi over four, right? Which is 45 degrees. So I'm gonna go 45 degrees and now I'm gonna plug that in to cosine of pi over four. What's cosine of pi over four? Root two over two. So this is two over root two. So that should just be root two. What is root two on your calculator? This is root two. I know what it is, but it's 1.414. Okay, I'm just gonna put 1.41. 1. 
So what I'm supposed to do is rotate by 45 degrees and walk out, not quite two, right? 1.4. So imagine, I'm gonna draw this as an imaginary line. I'm rotating by pi over four. So I'm aiming in that direction and I'm walking out 1.4. I would say 1.4 is about this far, right? Maybe about like from here to here is about 1.4 but I need to walk out this way that much. So I'm gonna have a dot, I don't know, somewhere around here. You understand? So I don't know, I'm gonna have a dot somewhere around here. Okay, keep going. Let's do another one. Let's rotate by pi over two. Okay, so what's R here? It's equal to two cosine of pi over two. What's cosine of pi over two? Zero. So this is zero, right? So that means I want to rotate by pi over two and don't go anywhere. Drop a dot right where you are. So I rotate by pi over two, which means I'm pointed straight up and I'm not walking out at all. So I'm dropping a dot right at the origin. Okay, let's keep going. Let's rotate three pi over four. 3 pi over 4 would aim me this way, right? So r will be equal to 2 times cosine of 3 pi over 4. What's cosine of 3 pi over 4? Negative root 2 over 2. And now the 2's cancel and you get negative 1.414. Wait a minute. Hold on a second. Yeah, I'm supposed to rotate pi over four, pi over two, three pi over four. So I'm, aim, I'm facing this way and I need to walk backwards. I need to walk backwards 1.4. So instead of walking out, I'm gonna start taking a step back, which is gonna take me in, so I'm aiming out, I'm, I'm aiming out this direction, right? That's where my, my face is pointed out that way, but I need to walk backwards. So I'm gonna wind up dropping a point right there, okay? And now let's do, let's just go one more, let's rotate again. Uh, when we get to pi, which is a half rotation, I'm pointed out to the left, right? And when I plug that in, I get two cosine of pi. What's cosine of pi? Negative one. So two times negative one, negative two. So I'm pointed out to the left, right, pi? And I need to walk back backwards too. So where am I going to be? Back where I started, right? Okay, we need more detail. This is not enough to see what this picture is. And we're already back to where we started. Do you all understand that? Do you have a question? Uh, what, like, uh, why isn't like on the x side going to be the y axis? Why is it on the x side going to be the x axis? So we, we pointed, so our angle is, is pi, right? So I'm rotating here by pi. So I'm, that means if I'm standing here, what I'm doing is I'm saying face that way, right? And then what is the radius? When we plug pi in here, what, is, what, what are we supposed to do? Negative two. So I'm facing this way, but I got to go back to. Okay, so that lands me back here. So instead of being facing that way and going out to, I went backwards to. Make sense? Okay, so to help you see this, I'm gonna to go to the computer and hold on. I believe for polar in Desmos, you just have to type R equals and then whatever the function is. So let's do R equals three and see what happens. Yeah, okay, so Desmos is smart enough to know you're talking about a polar function. There's R is three through the circle. So now I'm gonna change it to two. You ready to see this? This is gonna be cool. Two, was it cosine T or uh, cosine theta? I think it uses T. No. Uh oh. You have to type theta in. Just type theta? Yeah. There we go. Yeah. So it's a circle, but it looks like it's been moved off center, right? In fact, this is a circle. What's the radius of this circle? Let me take a picture of this real quick. Let me take a picture of this. Yeah. 
We drew a circle, but not centered at the origin, right? That's what we just did. So the equation, the equation of this circle, the equation in Cartesian would be, what's the center of the circle? One, zero, right? And then we have that generic formula for finding the equation of a circle centered at HK. Remember this? Pre-cal, okay. That's our formula. So this would be X minus one squared plus Y squared equals one. Do y'all agree that's the Cartesian equation of that circle? Yeah. Watch this. X squared minus two X plus one plus Y squared equals one. I just foiled out the left. Do y'all see that the ones cancel? And you're left with x squared minus 2x plus y squared equals zero, right? Now, I'm, I'm going to convert this to polar now. Remember the polar conversions. Remember this formula? R is equal to the square root of x squared plus y squared. And do you remember the formula also that x is equal to r cosine theta? Those are two of the polar uh, equations, right? The, the conversions. So if R is equal to this, then, then if I square both sides, what would I get? R squared is X squared plus Y squared, right? So what can I replace X squared plus Y squared with? R squared, right? That X squared plus Y squared becomes R squared. You, you got that? And then I have minus two times X, but what's X? r cosine theta. This must equal zero. Yeah? Factor an r out. Yes? Solve that equation. Set that to zero. Or the other one, r minus two cosine theta equals zero, right? And now on this one, just move the cosine theta to the two cosine theta to the other side. And you have the polar equation for that circle. Right? Isn't that what I gave you to start? R is this. Now, R being zero is kind of like an extraneous solution in some sense here. Because if R is zero, right? If R is zero, you're not drawing the circle, right? I mean, like it, it's just, well, I should say this it's this point only. It's that point only of the circle. Do you see that? This equation gives you just that point. This equation gives you the whole, all the rest of it. Make sense? So there is a way to get from Cartesian to polar, right? There's a way to get there. I just, that's all, I'm just showing you that, that that's how we can get to it. Um, all right, where are we? I feel time's, time's running out here. Let me see how much more I can do of this wrong one. Oh wait, polar. God dang it, man. There's so much cool stuff I wanna do still. Polar, so let me see here. Some other ones. So this, is, this was uh, two cosine theta, one plus sine theta. This is a different one. This is called a cardioid. I'm not gonna go into it, but it's got a pretty cool little picture. Um, R equals cosine of K theta. This is a cool one. I can adjust what K is. So right now, if this was just, right now it's R, R cosine of just one theta. That's what we're looking at right there. That's one theta. Now I'm gonna start adjusting. If I put two theta in here, watch what happens. If I put three theta, four theta, five, six, uh, that's as far as I went on my program. Pretty cool, huh? What would it be nice to be able to do to this? Maybe find the areas of these petals, right? Maybe find the arc length of this, right? Right? Yeah, I mean, there's different things we'd like to be able to do, right? Maybe. So how do you find the slope of the tangent line? Here's a formula. It's pretty messy looking, but here's the formula. 
Um, I have 22 minutes. Let's see. Yeah, so I don't think I want to work through this because I want to show you the next section. I just want to talk you through it. So if you're given R as a function of theta and you want to find the slope of the tangent line, then you're going to take the derivative of R with respect to theta, multiply it times sine theta, then add to it the R function. Let me just set this one up. Shit, I'll just, I'll just set this one up right here. I just really want to talk about the next thing. Okay, so for this particular problem, find the slope of tangent line. Here's our, here's our, our, our equation, our polar equation. I'm going to use this formula here. Okay, so here it comes. I need to know dr d theta. What is the derivative of r with respect to theta? So what's the derivative of this with respect to theta? Cosine theta. Okay, so I put cosine theta. Now I'm going to multiply that times what? Sine theta. Every single time you will multiply the times sine theta. Then plus, and now I put r. What's r? Well, r is this, right? One plus sine theta times cosine theta. All of this over, I know it looks terrible. All of this over dr d theta, which we already found, right? That's just cosine theta. This time times cosine theta, and then minus the r one plus sine theta, and this time times sine theta. And that is the derivative. It's ugly, but now if you know theta, you can, you can figure something out, right? So if I wanted to find the slope of the tangent line when theta is pi over three, I just plug pi over three into all of these and get an, an, I get an answer, right? If I wanted to find where the tangent line is horizontal, what would I need to do? Set the top to zero. You don't need to worry about the bottom being zero because a fraction can only be zero if the top is. So to find part B, you just set the top equal to zero and that's a trig equation you'd have to solve. And then to find where the tangent line is vertical means it's undefined, which means you want to set the bottom of this equal to zero. Do you think you could mess with that? You understand the idea? Plug pi over three into this, you get an answer. Set the numerator to zero, set the denominator to zero. I'll let you mess with that. All right, um, that's it for this section. I do want to talk about uh, nine four. So for polar functions, there is a super easy formula for finding the areas. So if, if you have R is some function of theta, then the area swept out by the function is the integral from A to B of one half R squared D theta. I'm not going through where this comes from, okay? The idea here is this, if you start sweeping out now the red dot is is going to draw the function so we have a polar function we start drawing something okay as we draw it we're picking up area understand yes okay now if we change it to a different function like maybe this then as we start sweeping through we start calculating this area it's kind of gets a little weird because of the way the curve is drawn but it will it will start calculating your area and the formula for it is integral a to b, where, where a and b are restrictions on theta, one half r squared d theta. Copy this. Got it? Check this out. You're gonna like this. Here's the formula. I want us to show that the area of a circle is pi r squared. We've already done it. This will be the third time we've done it in this class. Okay, I want us to show that the area of a circle is pi r squared. Okay, so let's take a circle with the radius of what? Let's say capital R, okay? I would like for you to prove to me that the area of that is pi r squared, okay? All right, so first you need to draw it for me. 
draw it for me in polar. So give me the polar, the polar function R equals something that's going to draw a circle of radius R, capital R. What is it? Oh, no. Nope. Just capital R. So it's centered at the, the origin, right? So isn't it just capital R? Remember, R equals three drew a circle with radius three. So R equals capital R will draw a circle of radius capital R. Super simple function. Now, when you draw it, you have to have a restriction on the angle. Because you're going to go, you're going to start at zero, you go out, you drop a dot at capital R. Then rotate, drop, rotate, drop, rotate, drop. And you want to go around one time, right? So we want this on the interval zero to two pi. Are you with me? Okay, let's find the area. Use this formula. I mean, this is freaking beautiful, watch. Integral from zero to pi times one half times, well, what's our, what's our radius function that we're gonna have to square here? It's just capital R, that's a constant. Capital R squared, d theta. Take out the one half capital R squared. Integral from zero to two pi of one d theta. The antiderivative of one d theta is just theta. So this is gonna be one half r squared times theta evaluated from zero to two pi. And when you plug in two pi for theta, you get the two, yeah, let's see. Then you get one half r squared times two pi. And what happens when you plug in zero? Kills it all off, the two and the half cancel and you get pi capital R squared. Polar is awesome. If you ever take Cal three, we use polar. Polar just makes life so much easier when you're trying to do certain, anytime you have circles. So I think we've talked a little bit about in Cal three, what we do is we take a surface floating in three dimensional space and we try and find the volume under it. So I know that seems like, okay, that, that seems like a interesting problem, but here's, here's a problem that, um, you can do that would be very hard without polar. Uh, take a ball, okay? Imagine you have a solid ball, okay? And imagine the, the x-axis, let me see, maybe I can bring up the picture of it real quick. I have a much better animation of this, hold on. God, I need more time, I always need more time. We've done good though, we got through chapter eight. So, I mean, that's already, we, we, it's already a win. Uh, See if I can find it quickly. Twelve, 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 four. I'm trying to remember the chapter here. Double twelve three. Double integrals in polar coordinates. Uh, here we go. The idea here is that we want to take a solid ball and we want to drill out. We want to drill out something from it, right? But not right through the center. I don't want to go through the center of the ball. That'd be too easy. I'd like to know the volume of this ball. Okay. So to do it, what we do is we imagine what we have to imagine what this looks like from the top on the ground. This right here is that little polar region we just did, two cosine theta, it's that offset circle. And once we get it to polar, everything just becomes so much easier. In fact, this is the, this is the actual integral. It's a double integral, but it's a, it's a doable integral. So anyways, I'm just trying to show you that it does come up a lot and it's very helpful later on. There's, there's nothing new in Cal 3 in terms of like, you've got differentiation and, and integration. Those are the basic, like the standard things for calculus. What you do in Cal 3 is you extend it out to higher dimensional space. 
And because of that, you also have to start talking about vectors. And so you, you wind up starting to talk about a lot of things in, in, in vectors, which means that your calculus needs to change to vectors also. So sometimes it's called like vector calculus too, towards the end. That's where you get these ideas of like flux and things like that. Okay, that's it. Um, let me see what, uh, what else I had here. We have to wrap it up. There's a formula for the area. There's a couple of examples here that I'm not gonna work through. Let's just say this, for a polar on the final, anything in terms of polar will be bonus extra credit, okay? Let's say that the 9.1 and 9.2, that's the uh, parametric, I think that would be fair game for the final, all right? Because I did cover that in some somewhat thorough, not really thorough, but I at least did some examples. Um, yeah. All right, we have seven minutes. We don't have a lot of time to talk about the final. Are there any questions? I do want to show you something before we leave, but are there any questions? I take it y'all are going to look at those reviews and see how they go. Yeah. Okay, just over the, you know, next week, my office hours will be spotty because I'll be giving finals at times I'm normally in my office hours. So if you need to get in touch with me to ask me any questions, feel free to, but make sure you've like thought it out and tried and then reach out to me and uh, text me, okay? Email probably won't be as quick. I have a cool question, Professor. Yes. Uh -huh. So we, uh, we're we going in class Wednesday uh, at nine? Uh, Wednesday at nine, yeah. Let me double check that. Wednesday, nine o'clock till 11.45. Um, when you come, let's do this. You, you are going to be allowed on this test to have your formula sheets. There's a ton of them, right? That you could have printed out on Canvas, yes? And let's do this. I'll let you have one reference sheet, okay? So that means you, you create your own sheet with front and back of a standard sheet of paper. Don't come in with like a you know 48 inch sheet of paper. Okay, just a standard eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper, front and back. You can type it up, you can handwrite it. The thing about it is you can have things like reminders on how to do things, steps and procedures. You can't just work out problems and put those on there, all right? But you can have anything that you think would help you, all right? And, uh, also make sure you bring your notes, bring your like homework problems, anything that you think could help you on the test. Do y'all remember what I did on one of the tests in here, right? Like the first 10 minutes, I let, let y'all look at some, I'm not telling you I will, but I don't want you to be the one person or two, two, one of the two people that didn't bring anything. Have your stuff with you in case I do open it up um, for a little while for you to kind of like take a look, all right? All right, I think we're good then. I'll be, I am still wanna show you something now. You can start packing up. I figured I'd end the class with something that blows your mind. What the hell's going on here? I think I may have just killed my pen. That might be a sign. I seriously think I may have killed it. Hmm. Oh, it's back. Maybe. All right, I'm gonna try this, see how it goes. It might, this might not let me do it. That's weird. It's like anytime I get close to this, it's drawing. It's not waiting for me to touch. I think I killed it. All right, well here, I, I did it before class, so I can just show it to you. Uh, I don't know how this is gonna work. Oh, you know what? 
Let me see something. I have another, another stylus here. Let me see if this stylus works. No, it doesn't. Well, you know what? I think this might be a sign. Because now I can't, it's not waiting for me to touch. It's just, it's just drawing. Like as soon as I bring it close to the screen, it just starts drawing. That sucks. Yeah, okay, that's gonna be it. I was gonna show you that there's a way to prove that one minus one plus one minus one plus one minus one plus one minus one plus one forever is one half. And there's another way to prove that one plus two plus three plus four plus five plus six forever is negative one twelfth. Yeah, it's weird stuff. And it's not actually technically, it's weird. It's not correct. But the higher up in math you go, it then becomes correct. It's really weird. It's really, really weird. So I can't show it to you. It's usually something I like to show just to kind of pique your curiosity. Just look it up on the web. One plus, you know, one minus one plus one minus one plus one. Look it up. You'll find some stuff on it. I got to figure out what I'm going to do. All right. Thank you all. Have a good, uh, good luck studying for all your finals. And I will see you next week. Okay. Shit. I don't know what I'm going to do here. I don't have a replacement for this. Do you replace the tip on that one? There is a tip, but I think I did something internal. Because I dropped it and it, it doesn't even have a charger. So I don't know what the hell I'm going to do. I'm not sure how many questions it's going to be. I need to make it. So I would just look at the, I would look at what I've given you. I think all of those are, are like similar in length. I think you'll be here the whole time. Yeah. Oh, wait a minute, hold on, maybe that's it. Did the tip come out? Yes, I'll see you.